My friends, check out this article. A British veteran fighting in Ukraine told the media, Iraq does not compare to this. It's far more intense. He says that enemy artillery crews are pretty bloody good. That they can hit your position 100 times a day. And he ends by saying, mentally, it's exhausting. You're just waiting for the artillery. Even private sins would not be able to endure all this banging. Now to continue our tradition, a quick tour of the situation of the battlefield of Bakhmut. Our beloved Ukrainskaya Armia is holding strong. No. So remember the Ukraine strongholds I marked as PAWG. Well, since our last video, train station W has fallen to enemy forces. And according to this footage, the Russians have also captured all the positions east of the railway line. And like I told you last video, we can assume that they will try to bypass this stronghold to this effect. It seems that Wagner PMC has already shifted its assault squads once more specifically on both flanks. Now instead of a frontal assault across the train tracks, Wagner has redeployed the bulk of its reserves to the north. And truth be told, using maneuver warfare, they completely overwhelmed Ukrainian defenses. And they're dangerously approaching this commie block citadel, leaving Ukraine troops with only PAG. That also means that Ukraine holds roughly 10% of the urban area of Bakhmut which is still defended by no less than 8,000 soldiers. At this point, Ukraine forces at Shupiyut. They're retreating. Uh, I mean, regrouping. Inside that high-rise district citadel for the final battle. I'll be blunt, but Wagner swallows one enemy stronghold after another like a Kraken. Actually, they should be renamed Kraken. I think it would be much more relevant. What? What do you mean it's already taken? By who? What? A Ukrainian battalion? But check out what this Ukrainian soldier had to say. Bakhmuti. Короче, как-то так. Сегодня у нас шо? Сегодня у нас 16 число. Ну такое. На самом деле все печально. Арта и баша не перестает. Наши нет. Nothing new here. Now the big question is whether Ukraine will pull off a US cavalry saves the day, an Alamo, or a Dunkirk. Meanwhile, Russian VDV units continue their push across the fields in the high ground north of Bakhmut. According to pro-Ukrainian deep state map, the paratroopers pushed along this tree line and that they're just about to get physical control of the supply road linking Hromove to Chasivyar in this area near the vehicle cemetery I've shown you in the past. If Ukraine doesn't counterattack soon, the road will be lost. Now there's another reason behind Wagner's big push lately. The Russians are now making heavy use of cheap giant glide bombs. The huge payload its low cost, its extended range and their accuracy are going to be a huge problem for Ukraine. Top Ukraine General Alexander Sirsky told the New York Times, Russian artillery and aerial attacks against Bakhmut are growing fiercer. Currently, the enemy is increasing the activity of heavy artillery and the number of airstrikes turning the city into ruins. Airstrikes! That's a term I haven't heard for a while coming from the Russian side. All over the front, there are more and more reports of Russian aviation carrying an increasing amount of airstrikes. Often we see multiple jets flying directly over Ukrainian positions. Here's what remains from a Ukrainian base near Kupiansk after a Russian airstrike. What the Ukraine command is worrying about comes from multiple reports that the Russians are using a new kind of bomb called the FAB-500. It's a pretty fabulous weapon that the Russians have fabricated. I agree, it was a bad one. I swear I'll stop unless I'm provided with a green screen. Here you can see the crater resulting from the explosion of one of these Fab 500s. In this other video, we're told that the crater is at least 50 meters wide. That's 164 feet for my Yankee friends. As you can imagine, such bombs can make easy work of Ukrainian strongholds in Bakhmut. And there are many reports 
on the ground claiming that these high-precision bombs will minimize the need for Russian assault squads to storm Ukraine positions and thus reduce their overall casualties. Welcome to History Legends and here are the latest news of the Russo-Ukrainian war. If you're new to this channel, make sure to like and subscribe. And now, a quick word from today's sponsor. Global conflicts like the war in Ukraine may seem a world away, but the effects on the world economy have been devastating. Immediately after the invasion, gas prices in Europe shot up a stunning 275%, and in the US, a gallon of gas reached as high as $5. These skyrocketing costs are not only hurting consumers, but businesses too. Their profits are getting crushed. And the effects are being felt deeply by investors in the stock market. Just 2.6% of companies in the S&P 500, the largest, most important companies in the world, expect their earnings to be just positive this quarter. You don't have to be a financial genius to know that's bad news. As a result, market watchers like Morgan Stanley say the market has reached levels of risk called a death zone and could collapse 26% by June. So what are the savvy investors doing? They're racing to diversify away from stocks. That's why thousands of my subscribers are already using a platform that specializes in blue chip art investments, an asset class whose prices outpaced the S&P 500 by 131% over the last 26 years. It's the art investing platform Masterworks. And since my first video on Masterworks back in November, they've sold four offerings. Those three sales handed back 10.4, 13.9, and 35% net returns to their investors. And just a week ago, Masterworks sold another offering for 15.4% realized profit to their investors after just a month. That brings Masterworks to over $30 million return to the investors to date, even during record turmoil. So there's now a wait list to join. But as a partner of the channel, they're giving you guys priority access right now. You can join now by clicking the link in the description below. Thank you to everyone that has already helped and welcome to the headquarters. The technology behind the FAB 500 is not new. In fact, the FAB 500 M62 dates back from the 1960s. By the way, FAB is a Russian acronym that stands for Fugazi Avia Bomb, literally high explosive aerial bombs. And the 500 stands for 500 kilograms, or just over 1,000 pounds in freedom units. Then there's also the FAB. 1500, but the Ukrainians warned that the Russians might be preparing heavier models like a FAB 3000 and even an FAB 5000. Then have a look at this picture from an explosion that happened in Bakhmut. This could be seen 20 kilometers away and whatever this is, I mean, some claim that this mushroom was caused by one of the FAB 1500. Now, how does this technology work? So Russian fighter bombers are equipped with these heavy bombs. Nothing special here. But they manage to turn these dumb bombs into guided ones at a very cheap cost. Because the Russians already have guided bombs, but they're very expensive. Essentially, Russian engineers attach a very cheap MPK module, Module Planirovania Ikaretsky, literally gliding and correction module. And they attach each one of these modules to one of these dumb bombs. This module has special wings that can glide and increase the bomb's range. Truth be told, I think the module we see in this picture is an experimental one. Most likely, we will not see pictures of the actual MPK module online. Here we can see the wire running down from the rear of the wing kit to the pylon to which the bomb is attached. And here, if we take a look at the rear of the wing kit, the stabilizer is seen attached in a way that might indicate it can articulate up and down. But instead of having this global navigation satellite system inside the bomb, it's inside this module and when the bomb is dropped it now has a circular error probability of 10 meters thus they managed to turn the soviet era bombs into high precision satellite guided glide bombs at a very low cost 
This allows Russian fighter jets to drop the bombs at an altitude of 15 kilometers high from a distance of up to 50 kilometers from the target, and upon impact destroy everything within a range of 50 to 80 meters. And the Russians have a huge arsenal of these Soviet-era bombs. Some claim that the upgraded FAB-500 can even rival the efficiency of cruise missiles. Disclaimer, understand that these have completely different purposes, but let's just take a look at the stats. Now what's crazy is that a caliber cruise missile carries the same 450 kilogram warhead as an FAB-500. Only difference is that the FAB-500 is much cheaper. For the cost of production of one caliber missile, Russia can line up 270 FAB-500s. And its low cost means that they can directly be used on the front. Now, according to the Ukraine Air Force, up to 20 of these guided bombs are dropped on the front line every 24 hours, with Russian Sukhoi-34 or Sukhoi-35 jets used as carriers. Now, of course, the best way to counter enemy fighter jets would be for the Ukrainian ones to be present in the sky. But if we take a look at DPS map, according to the Russian MOD, on the 19th of April alone, three Ukrainian MiG-29 and a Sukhoi-25 were reported shut down. Now, disclaimer number two, Americans have already developed a similar technology and have released it in 1997. It's called the Joint Direct Attack Munition, or JDMM. JDMA. JDAM. It's a guidance kit that converts unguided bombs into precision guided munitions. It's literally the same definition. And instead of the Fab 500, we have the 1000 pound Mark 83 bomb. They even have the same weight. Now the reason the US media is freaking out about the FAB 500 bombs is because they just realized that their adversary is not boarding Toyota trucks in pajamas and sandals. Anyway, talking about the Jdemage JDAM. Political now claims Russia is jamming US smart bombs in Ukraine. A larger problem is that Russia is using GPS jamming to interfere with the weapons targeting process. American officials believe Russian jamming is causing the JDAMs and at times other American weapons such as guided rockets to miss their mark. Well, that would explain why we haven't heard much of the holy high Mars much lately. The big problem the Kiev Independent mentions is the effective range of Ukrainian air defense capabilities. Ukrainian S-300 systems can cover a range of up to 75 kilometers, Buk M1 systems 35 kilometers, and the OSAs only 12 kilometers. As you can imagine, for those to be effective, they have to be as close as possible to the front. However, in that case, these systems would almost inevitably be spotted by Russian radio electronic reconnaissance and targeted by enemy artillery. And this has already caused a number of Ukrainian anti-air systems to be destroyed like this short-range 9K33 OSA. And to knock down Ukrainian radars, Russian aircraft fire a KH-31P anti-radar missile. And once this is done, this is when all the Sukhois come in with their fabulous weapons. Now we can believe that a lot of these Ukrainian radars and air defense systems have been spotted and destroyed during Sorovikin's campaign against Ukraine's energy sector. But this decrease in air defense now allows Russian helicopters to enter the dance and provide close air support for their troops on the ground, but also allows them to target and destroy Ukrainian artillery pieces. Like this footage of a strike on an American self-propelled M109 Paladin. Now the situation is even more tense because the New York Times wrote the following. Stocks of missiles from Soviet-era S-300 and Buk air defense systems, which make up 89% of Ukraine's protection against most fighter aircraft and some bombers, were projected to be fully depleted by May 3rd and mid-April, according to one of the leaked documents. This is now! As a summary, Ukrainians don't have enough air defense systems that are at the same time running out of missiles. And as a result, the almost intact Russian Air Force is now bombing the front line on a daily basis. This is the worst! The document also mentions that this decrease in anti-air capabilities means that Ukraine could lose the ability to mass ground troops. And honestly, I feel this will be a big problem for Ukraine's armored columns for the upcoming spring offensive. We all remember the problems that Ukraine's faced in Kherson. Now just imagine the impact if Russian aircraft drop such high-precision glide bombs on these Ukrainian tanks. 
I'm not an expert, but I think the impact will not be the same as for Lancet. We already got a taste of what it could be like on April 18th, when Ukrainians launched a probing attack in Zaporozhye. And this is the picture of the resulting Russian airstrike in that sector. You know me, I'm rather pessimistic, but Ukrainians better be super creative for the next offensive. And let's be honest, I don't think they can realistically launch their offensive without being covered by air defense. So this is why European countries are now increasing these weapon deliveries. That's why Germany urgently transferred one Patriot air defense system battery to Ukraine. In addition, Sweden delivered an unknown amount of RBS-70 short-range air defense systems, as well as PS-70 radars that can detect targets at a distance of up to 40 kilometers. We've often talked about Wagner's heavy reliance on artillery. Now, the bandmaster of the orchestra, Evgeny Prigozhin, said basic math must be followed. I don't like to do this, but I will paraphrase what he said because the direct translation is a bit awkward. He said, there are 80,000 Ukrainian soldiers around Bakhmut. 30,000 of them are standing directly in the trenches in front of us. In order to advance 100 to 200 meters a day, 6,000 shells are required. In that case, our sanitary losses will be 20 people per day irretrievable and 40 people per day wounded. Meanwhile, the enemy's losses will be about 500 people. Now, if we only get 3,000 shells, the missing shells will increase our losses to 120 irretrievable losses and 200 wounded per day, while enemy losses will decrease to 300 people per day. However, what we do know from Western media reports is that Ukraine faces a severe lack of artillery shells. They burned through almost all their Soviet-era stocks. And now same thing for the sweet NATO ammo. It's nothing new, because the same happened during World War I. In 1914, nobody expected a long war, and everybody started running out of ammunition in early 1915. More artillery shells were fired during the 35-minute artillery barrage preceding the assault on Neuf Chapelle in March 1915 than during the entire Boers' War. To date, the US alone has supplied Ukraine with more than 1,105,000,000 1 shells. Meanwhile, according to Politico, EU countries have provided Ukraine with about 350,000 105mm shells. So a total of 1.3 million shells delivered to Ukraine. Problem is, NATO's reserves are now starting to dry out. The US Secretary of the Army reported that the US defense industry can currently produce about 14,000 105 mm howitzer shells per month, boost to 20,000 by spring and up to 90,000 per month by 2025. But Ukraine needed an immediate solution. They told the European Union they need at least 250,000 shells per month. Magic, magic. Here from Reuters, South Korea to send 500,000 shells to the US, uh, to Ukraine. Is that enough. I understand that it can vary from day to day, but if we average these claims, according to the Defense Department, Ukrainians are using around 90,000 shells per month. So the 500,000 shells from South Korea could keep Ukraine afloat for another five and a half months. That's all I have for you today. Let me know in the comment section what you thought of my analysis. If you're new to this channel, make sure to like and subscribe. And if you want to support my work, make sure to check out my Patreon or PayPal. The links are in the description below.